So a very good morning to all of you, uh, specifically to my fellow panelists, Mr. Mohandas Pai, Mr. Siddharth Pai, and Mr. Karan will be joining us in a few minutes if he is not already there. Uh, my name is K. Kumar. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at IM Bangalore. And one of the many things I've been doing is having been associated with NSRCL almost right from its inception. And I thank Venki for inviting me to conduct this panel discussion today with these eminent panelists. Uh, the topic of this discussion is uh, budget and beyond for the startup ecosystem. Um, this is a fairly interesting uh, topic, just coming as it is around uh, the time the annual budget has just been presented in the parliament by the finance minister just uh, uh, 10, 14 days ago. Uh, I must confess that the, the significance of budget has changed over a period of time. Uh, Mr. Pai, Mohandas Pai would remember those days when we used to crowd around the radio or television and taking notes feverishly about what, what which is going, which price is going up, which is coming down, which tax is going up, etc. From those days, a lot of changes have happened thanks to the 30 years of the liberalized economy, which we all have uh, experienced. But as they say, the more things change, the more things remain the same. So the excitement around the budget hasn't dipped even one bit in spite of all the changes that has happened around the economic policy making. And budget seems to be a fairly interesting event for us to think about uh, what is happening on, on the economic sphere, particularly with respect to the government's policies, its approaches to taxation, facilitation of business activities, etc. So in that sense, the budget is a very important activity. And uh, this year also it had its own excitement, particularly because of the, the, the unprecedented pandemic situation we all faced, which had a lot of implications on different aspects of our life and not the least on the economic aspect of our life. So a lot of announcements were made, a lot of tweaking was done during this period uh, through the budget. So we'll very briefly look at some of those things as they relate to this, the startup ecosystem. So we'll not spend a lot of time on that just to have pick up some pointers in terms of what is going well and what could have been done. That's one pasture of our discussion today. Then we'll go to the beyond part of today's topic. You know, it's, we are also talking about budget and beyond. So we'll bring the, the, the broader approach to the ecosystem into our discussion and then see what things can be done better for us to make the startup ecosystem a little more vibrant and a little more positive than what it is perhaps today. And uh, this is an area where our panelists have a lot of uh, experience and insights because of their deep involvement in the entrepreneurial activities. So without much ado, I'll go on to introducing our panelists today. Uh, we have Mr. Mohandas Pai, who is very well known to all of us. He is the chairman of the uh, uh, chairman of Arin Capital, uh, Manipal Global Education, and a number of other prestigious organizations. Uh, he is also on the board of Havels India and also Institute of Public Enterprises and the National Inf Investment Infrastructure Fund. He was awarded the Padma Shri by the President of India in 2015 and the Karnataka Rajyotsava Award in 2008. Mr. Mohan previous, Pai previously served as a board member and chief financial officer of Infosys for over a span of 17 years. I am very happy that he has chosen to join us today and I extend a very hearty welcome on behalf of all of you. And Thank you. Mr. Mohan Pai. Our next panelist is Mr. Siddharth Pai. He is the founding partner and CEO of, of, CFO of 314 Capital. And I'm sure many of you have noticed that 314 Capital was in the news as late as yesterday in the context of their investments in Q. I'm sure uh, I wish them all the best with that investment. Now, uh, 314 is a fund house based in Bangalore with cumulative assets under management of over $200 million. Mr. Siddharth Pai is an expert policy member of iSpirit, the Indian software product industry roundtable. He also previously petitioned the government to change the dreaded angel tax regulations in India. I'm sure we are going to discuss it a little bit as we go along. And he's currently working on the List in India and Stay in India initiatives. And a very hearty welcome to you, Mr. Siddharth Pai from NSRCL, from all of us in the panel and the audience today. Thank you very much. Yes. Our third panelist is Mr. Karan Bajaj. Uh, I don't know if he has already joined in case he hasn't yes. joined in a few minutes. No, I'm here, sir. Joining from, good oh, you're here, Karan. Very good. Good to yes. see you. Good morning. Thank good you. Good morning. 
uh, Mr. Karan, before everything else, is an illustrious uh, alumnus of IIM Bangalore. I think that's the first introduction I should give about Karan. And uh, Karan founded White Hat Junior in 2018 with the vision of making children creators of technology rather than being passive consumers of it. In August 2020, Karan joined hands with Baiju's uh, to further accelerate this vision. Karan is one of, one of, of course, I mentioned that he's one of our prestigious alumni. He has previously served as the CEO for Discovery Incorporated South, in South Asia, while also having worked with companies like Procter & Gamble, BCG, and Kraft Foods Group, and more. He's also an author of the bestseller, Keep Off the Grass. And uh, Karan is joining us from the US. Thank you very much. I know the time is not very, very friendly to you at this point in time. Please, uh, it's anyway, uh, I'm glad that you're able to join at this time of the day Pleasure. for you, right? Right. Okay, uh, now that we have welcomed all the participants, let me quickly get on with the uh, topic of, for the discussion today. So as I mentioned, I'll open with the, uh, the, the recent budget that the government uh, presented in the parliament on February 1st. Uh, there have been a few announcements in the budget which are of uh, relevance to the startup ecosystem. Uh, if we were to particularly look at some of the announcements, there has been an extension of uh, IT exemption, there has been an extension of uh, long-term capital gains tax exemption, removal of the threshold level of investment in limited liability partnerships, and also the removal of restrictions on paid up capital for and turnover for one person, one person companies. These are all things which directly talk to the startups and the requirements, but I'm sure there are a lot more which the budget has uh, partly either indirectly or directly addressed towards the startup ecosystem. So let me bring in Mr. Mondas Fai here. And uh, are there anything in this budget which is uh, uh, likely to have a significant impact on the well-being of the startups? Uh, how do you see that? Well, are there any? Yes, Mr. Kumar, I, I want to be very honest and not politically correct. Okay. <laughs> this budget has been a disaster for the startup industry. We wanted okay. many things to be said, but nothing okay. has happened. Mm. It, uh, it seems that as if the bureaucracy just goes to ministers and points her to some small things and say they'll make a big impact. Mm -hmm. And she spoke about it, which is very sad considering that she's our finance minister and MP from Bangalore. Okay. For example, this, uh, you know, uh, startup is the exemption for capital gains. It has no meaning. It's just 50 lakhs. And I don't know how much has been invested. And okay. it's got many, many riders. I'm sure Siddharth is an expert. He'll talk about the riders. And second, about the tax holiday, the last I saw was only 375 companies out of the 50,000 yeah. startups have got that. That's and true. there's an inter-ministerial group consisting of bureaucrats who decide whether you are eligible. Yeah. The bureaucracy has mastered the art of uh, giving it one hand and taking away another hand. Mm -hmm. You must remember for the software industry, Section 10A of the Income Tax Act was responsible for the huge growth. Right. It happened yeah. in watch-based government when they had yeah. a 108 program. Mm -hmm. It's a very clean and neat. It gave it to everybody. And you saw we got a world-class industry with 45 mm -hmm. lakh jobs today. Now, we have been asking for many things. I'll, we'll talk about that later. But both yeah. these things are inconsequential. Okay. As for increasing the you know, pay, paid up capital limit, that's there for everybody. It's not for startup. And I don't think it's got any meaning because nobody asked for that. Okay. And for this 1% company to transition, yeah, it is okay. I have not seen anybody from a 1% company. Okay. I mean, I've not seen them. I mean, we literally see 300, 400 startups a, a month hmm. in our office. And I've not seen anybody talk about that, do that, because it's totally immaterial. Okay. So they do these small, small things and blow it up as if it is a manna from heaven for us. <laughs> I'll talk about what we wanted. Mm. I think these are all inconsequential because, you know, Professor, today we have 50,000 startups. Mm. Five to 6,000 come up every year. 1,000 get funded. We get 11 to $12 billion of capital coming in. Mm. From 2014 till now, we got $70 billion of capital. Sadly, only 10% is Indian. We okay. got 43 unicorns, mm. out of which about 23, 24 are domiciled outside because mm. of lack of capital. Mm. The issues in this country are very different. Mm. And what the bureaucrats and the budget tries to do is, uh, you know, immaterial. Mm. Well, I don't think this will move the leader in any, any manner. Today, mm. among the startup community, young people, most of them want to go domicile outside. Yeah. They domicile outside because they're fed up of this regulation, fed up of harassment. For mm. example, that angel tax, which mm. was brought in. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally went to the PMO. I spoke mm. to the, you know, mm. top person there in the PMO and told him about this, he got the changes done. For three, for three times, the regulations which came were all wrong. Mm -hmm. They promised something in a meeting. I met the then finance secretary, and he said, yeah, what you want is correct. And then when the regulation comes, they talk about something else. They put more and more controls, give more okay. and more discretion. 
Mm. And the 56 uh, two or something is unnecessary. Yeah. You don't even need that. And that will lead to a lot of harassment and, mm. you know, graft. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll tell you for young people, they require a very clean process like we had for the IT industry, which is yeah. very simple to mm. incentivize them because they'll go elsewhere. Yeah, okay. I mean, they will go elsewhere, set up the company elsewhere. For example, you've got this incubator, uh, Y Combinator, I think. They're very clear yeah. that yeah. you want you come to a combinator, you've got to register in Singapore, we'll give you some capital, but you've got to be outside India. We don't okay. want to do it in India. Okay. And most of the big funds say, if you want big money, come outside. Because why? RBI regulations are perverse. Tax regulations, you don't know what will happen. Yeah, we are all here. We are all, you know, like you and I, we are patriotic, we love our country, we want right. to be here. But young people don't want to put up with all this. So I think, you know, this budget has not, budget okay. has not taken any, any steps, in my view, to change anything much. Okay. Thank you. That's a, that's a very, very candid and uh, honest appraisal of what is going on. I'm sure you'll have a lot more to say. I'll come back to you once we talk about the way ahead. Uh, maybe I should bring in Mr. Siddharth Pai now because I, I, uh, Mr. Mohandas Pai already given me a hint that you have a lot more to say on this, what, what these uh, uh, you know, tinkering all mean for the startups and in what ways they're going to be beneficial or these benefits really significant. Or how do you see that, Mr. Siddharth Pai? Uh, so... Professor, first of all, I think uh, most of the, you're actually seeing the collective, the, uh, the only collective sigh of relief from all the entrepreneurs is the fact uh -huh. that there are no new taxes that have actually been right. uh, levied on them or an entrepreneurship for that matter. Uh, that being said, I do, I do, I do wholeheartedly agree with what, with what Mr. Uh, Mr. Pai actually said. Uh, the ATIAC, I'll actually break it down bit by bit. So starting okay. off with the, with the tax holiday, mm -hmm. uh, the tax holiday is contingent on two things. Number one, the startup being incorporated after April 1st, 2016. And number mm -hmm. two, the startup being credited as, innovative by the interministerial board as mr okay. pai also mentioned the interministerial board is a group of uh, is a, is yeah. a group of bureaucrats who essentially have to certify whether a company is innovative or not now okay. if, if you've been following the honorable prime minister's speeches he said that the innovation economy needs to contribute up to one trillion dollars by the year 2025 mm -hmm. and by by the actions of the interministerial board it's obvious that there only there are about 400 companies in the entire country that actually need to contribute one trillion dollars in terms of gdp by mm -hmm. the year 2025. So you can see the stark disconnect between the, uh, the politicians as well as the bureaucratic mechanism that's actually underpinning this. Okay. And the definition of innovative uh, innovation and the process which the IMB follows is unfortunately broken. Mm -hmm. I do have actual evidence of the rejection letters that the IMB have sent, mm -hmm. where they said that, okay, if, you, if you're on the business model of, let's say, search, you mm -hmm. have Google, you have Bing, you have, uh, you have uh, Yahoo, you have so many search engines, hence you're not considered innovative. This one is to one comparison of business models based on the industry you're in as opposed to the actual business model of what you're actually doing is denying all these companies a particular benefit. If you take the example of White Hat Junior as well, if White Hat Junior actually applied, they would have said, look, there's already Code Academy, there's already these guys who are helping you code. Hence, how can you be considered as innovative? And White Hat Juniors had one of the largest gas exits in the entire history of the startup ecosystem itself for an early stage company. These are the kind of companies that are being denied these particular benefits because of the IMB ministry. And even when, even when Arun Jaitley also introduced the mm. tax holiday in the year 2016, mm. he's also said that the minimum alternate tax or MAT would actually apply at the rate of 15%. So it wasn't a true tax holiday. Mm. It was just a reduction in tax that actually happened for these particular people. And Arun Jaitley also, as you remember, is a person who said that the, in the Indian IT, IT sector grew because the, because the government did not actually interfere in that. They actually right. let them a free reign. They allowed market yeah. forces to actually uh, take yeah. force. And mm. hence, we've actually seen behemoths. India mm. has the largest IT services giant in the entire world now. True. It's top at Accenture, it's top at IBM. Mm. That becomes one. So the ATIAC part has been so muted by only 400 companies have actually received this. And the mm. conditions that go along with that are even more onerous. If you mm. take it on the second part of this uh, the income tax holiday, the section 54 GB, Okay. That's actually contingent. This is actually one of the most perverse sections that have been inserted. It's contingent on a person selling, selling any house property, reinvesting that gains for 50% of a startup for 50 lakhs. Mm -hmm. Professor, you're, as you can speak to any of your students, no entrepreneur, no matter how bad it is, is going to give up 50% of his company for 50 right. lakhs. Yeah. It is next to impossible. Previously, three years ago, until the year 2018, if I remember correctly, that particular startup could not invest into, uh, into computers and software. If they did, they would actually be excluded. Mm -hmm. How is that supposed to actually support the tech, uh, tech industry if startups can't actually invest into software and computers? Mm -hmm. Along with this, the investments are only into equity shares. Most of the founders, most of the investors who want to come in, financial investors prefer preference shares for the rights and everything attributed to that. That also becomes muted. And mm -hmm. along with this, if the startup exits within a period of five years, the entire gain actually gets taxed in the year of exit. Mm -hmm. So this is in case an exits are actually vibe, exits are needed for a vibrant startup economy. And yeah. Unfortunately, these are the kind of conditions that hobble this particular section. So that section has 
it has a completely immaterial effect on the entrepreneur or any of the investors investing into them. If you take the third part with regard to OPC, the OPC construct is actually fantastic for sole proprietorships, mm -hmm. primarily because it creates a corporate wrapper around them, which actually allows them to insulate their personal assets uh, right. from their uh, from their businesses. That's number one. It allows them easy, uh, better access to capital because banks are more comfortable dealing with corporates as opposed to dealing with individuals or sole proprietors. Right. But the drawback of an OPC is it's in the name itself. It's a one-person company. Don't you can only yeah. have one person as a member. The moment you have to go actually raise capital, it becomes right. nobody can invest into an OPC. An OPC is a bootstrap, self-sustaining organization. That's right. number one. Number two, if you want to give ESOPs as well, not, none of the OPC people can actually give ESOPs because the exactly. moment you give ESOPs, you actually become a private limited company in that regard. So the OPC is not going to is not it's, it's not going to be a positive contributor to the startup ecosystem where startups actually raise venture capital or private equity funding and actually grow. So none of this budget is actually. This budget is more conspicuous in what it hasn't addressed. And these are large amount, large number of issues that hopefully we'll tackle in some time. Mm. ESOP taxation is still the most perverse in the entire world. And there's mm. and, and there's complete, and I do have a summary of how the rest of the world actually taxes these right. ESOPs as opposed to India. That becomes number one. Number two, if you look at the money that's actually caught up in terms of your tax refunds for startups, especially, a large number of these are unprofitable ventures. The amount of tax money that actually gets caught up just in terms of tax deducted as source. Actually, mm -hmm. adversely affects the working capital for all these particular startups. That's become two. Number three, the cost of capital in this country is actually at an all-time high. Your bank debt, if a startup even managed to get a bank debt, it's anywhere between 12 to 18 percent. The moment you have an entrepreneur has to pay 12 to 18 percent on the debt that they actually have to take, and they have to return 30 percent on the equity. The entire mechanics of that actually gets actually completely convoluted. So the Indian government actually erred in terms of not concentrating on easing the easing the cost of capital reducing the taxation on ESOPs, creating a larger number of entrepreneurs and startups in the country could actually start contributing actively to the development as well. Mm -hmm. What India is instead trying to do is India is trying to narrow base the entire approach, uh, have an inverted pyramid where a large amount of, a, a, a large burden is actually placed upon a very small number of entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and the lack of domestic capital or the barriers to domestic capital, which I hopefully would like to talk about in some time, yeah. are actually what's accelerating India's rise the, the transition or the brain drain of Indian entrepreneurs to, uh, to people outside the country. India is not going to be a land of startups in the next five to six years and then the government actually steps in. India is going to become a land of subsidiaries where everyone's going to set up the setup shop in either the US, Singapore, UK, any other such jurisdiction, have a, have a subsidiary in India and India is only going to see, India is only going to see economic actually through the subsidiary. All our IP, all the assets, everything is actually going to be offshore unless the government actually steps in. The next wave of IPOs are going to happen to countries. It's not going to happen here. It's going to happen on NASDAQ to SPACs. It's going to happen in Singapore instead. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, that. I think uh, that is, a, again, a very more detailed view of uh, what is happening today. Uh, I think what we have heard both from Ms. Mohanda Pai and Mr. Siddharth Pai is that, you know, after, despite all this excitement around startups and everybody saying that the startups are the future of this country, the innovation from the startups is what is going to make us a powerful economy. But on the ground, the way the policies are formulated, the way they are implemented, the way they are made easy for access, to be accessed by the startups is something which leaves a lot to be decided. A lot of useful uh, uh, insights came in with respect to cost of capital, with respect to the ease of exits, with respect to the, the a, a kind of, a, when you do the reality check in terms of what is made as support for the uh, startups and what is possible to be realized, there seems to be a lot of gap here. We will come back to these issues. Maybe at this point in time, I should bring in uh, Karan Bajaj into this discussion. Uh, Karan, you are also one of the uh, startups, your company, we just tried, we, you started in 2018, and uh, you're also trying to take uh, your startup pretty global. You know, the, the, the most of these days, I mean, the, most of the startups are also going global at a very early stage in their life. And uh, now that you're experiencing, uh, going through the experience of taking your startups to different countries in the world, what has been your experience? How do those ecosystems compare with what we have here? And what do you think that we should have, we should do better here in this particular ecosystem? Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, actually, it's been a very big learning for me, this session itself. So, so I would say as a very, you know, as a kind of a venture backed, like very practical entrepreneurship uh, experience, I would say, like um, you know, we don't think much about all of this stuff, right? So in the in the in the in the in the broader sense of things, I would say startups are so binary. You know, they're so zero or one that uh, uh, you know, like that that like uh, you know what I mean. Like what uh, what I mean by that is that the tax implication of it, typically, at least on a venture backed ecosystem, 
um look you know we are broadly aware of the tax implications obviously we because we see that numbers every day but the startups are so binary that uh, that basically as long as the government is not actively interfering and what i saw as a as an entrepreneur is i felt that uh, that uh, starting the company was very easy in india as like which i thought was a very very big benefit right i think uh, when i started the company it was very easy to start the company but i felt like the biggest issue was the capital inflows and outflows and all the rbi uh, like uh, 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 regulations related to that right and i think that will uh, that uh, to the point that siddharth and uh, uh, also made just before that that inhibits the ability right. to like uh, because i was told exactly that right so i'd raised my first 1.3 like i'd raised two rounds of funding and i was about to raise the third round before the beju acquisition in the first round of funding uh, we obviously incorporated the company in india Uh, the ca- capital i raised at that time was 1.3 million dollars then i raised 10 million dollars till then it was uh, fine the moment i st- uh, i was raising a significant series b round of 50 million dollars or so mm-hmm. the advice was about incorporation uh, like you know like setting up a parent to uh, the, the all the advice i uh, received was in context of making the future inflows and outflows of the capital much easier by having a parent incorporated outside it, like you know uh, india and all of that stuff right so i think uh, as an entrepreneur i would say the good part is that uh, it's easy to set up the negative part is that uh, capital inflows and outflows individually and for the company becomes harder especially as the capital raise keeps increasing and i think that should really be fixed because the, the as i said startups are so binary that if you've discovered something that's working uh, you know we should try to catch like we should try to capture the value stream of that innovation in india it's very sad if we are losing the value stream of the of a high caliber innovation outside india when it comes from india okay right so i think we we felt the same way right as, as the stakes got higher as the capital got bigger and the uh, the like uh, we like uh, we we went through the same cycle of where on whether the incorporation was a negative so at, at a small scale it was working well at a very large scale it should actually work uh, more positively but it actually didn't you know Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Karan. I think that that's that's a good pointer in terms of uh, when the startups are poised for growth and when they are in a position to raise capital, suddenly this ecosystem becomes not the most optimal ecosystem for Correct. startups to survive, yeah. thrive, thrive in. I think uh, that would be sad, as you rightly said, that after putting in all the effort and the value is getting created, uh, you are not seen as the right ecosystem for capturing all that value, which is a very uh, which is a, a very disappointing kind of a situation if i may say so now let me come back to mr mohan das pai you know let's look ahead we are also talking about budget and beyond so let's leave the budget behind and then talk about the life beyond uh, let me request you to focus first on uh, the one critical aspect of uh, uh, startups particularly the high growth startups you know it's it's no brainer that the high growth startups need to attract a lot of capital and you made two interesting points i think which was also supported by mr siddharth pilar later one is this capital flows in the startup this whole process is so murky in the sense like you know it is not a very friendly process at all one and second you also pointed out a lot of this capital at this point in time notwithstanding the vibrancy of the startup ecosystem many of this capital is coming from outside the local capital is not flowing towards indian startups right and if you take these issues to together what do you think needs to be done going forward how do you, how can we improve this situation uh, professor i will talk about three big issues which are required because they're all linked yeah. together okay the first three is shortage of capital let me give data first okay the largest ecosystem for innovation and startups in the united states okay venture invests 135 billion dollars a year right enormous amount of capital they go public they get over subscribed there's a flood of capital in the united states mm-hmm. market capitalization 44 trillion dollars mm-hmm. all right next is china china is huge 65 billion dollars invested every year mm-hmm. 60% comes from chinese companies mm-hmm. the third largest is india 11 to 12 billion only 10% is indian capital mm-hmm. like i said from 2014 till now we got 70 billion dollars only 10% is indian capital Hmm. why is indian capital not coming into startups okay the tax laws are very perverse in this country hmm. if you invest in a startup hmm. it is reckoned to be an unlisted company hmm. you pay 20% tax hmm. and if you get income on gains above 5 crores hmm. you have to pay 38% surcharge so it is 28% yeah now if you go to a stock market you never pay tax hmm. last year from 2 years back they started putting 10% tax hmm. you pay 11% 
Mm. In the stock market, you've got 375 unicorns. It is vibrant. There's information. Mm. There's visibility. There's liquidity. Mm. You hold for a year. You pay only 11% tax. Mm. So investors will take the easy way out and mm. go invest in area. India is the only country in the world where you take greater risk, you pay greater tax. Okay. You take mm. great risk, you pay great tax. And when you get a write-off, they harass you. Why this write-off? Why that write-off? Too many conditions. Mm. So the tax laws are very perverse. Mm. That the biggest drawback for individuals and others to put money into startups. Mm. And then if you look at uh, RBI regulations. Okay. RBI has got very perverse regulations which harass people who put in money. For example, mm. if a foreign capital comes and puts money into Indian company, you have to file a form, you have to give all kind of documentation. Tomorrow when they sell, you got to get a valuation report. I mean, Professor, have you ever heard in a country when you sell a company, you got to get a professional value certificate? <laughs> Okay. for unleashed company. I mean, how is valuation done? Is negotiated between two parties. Right. You come and say, this is what I want. You come and say, this is what it is. And you do it. Hmm. Big companies do the same. They hmm. don't go get a valuation certificate. Right. They negotiate. And the negotiated price is what it is. And hmm. no valuation certificate can justify the valuation decided by two people. One hmm. a buyer, one a seller. Perfect hmm. competition with the buyers and the sellers. And they decide. Who is yeah. the value decide? RBI wants valuation certificate. Hmm. You look at the telefile document. You can't take the money out. Facebook came and bought an Indian company. You know, for them to complete the transaction took eight months. Hmm. Eight months. And they still continue documentation. There's a way out. For example, if you're an FBI, you come into the market, you go to a depository, and hmm. the deposit will take care of all your KYC and all documentation. Hmm. Then you sell in the market, you can take the money out immediately because they will provide the documentation. Hmm. Why can't we have the depository system? Hmm. And RBI is very perverse. Then RBI's policy on overseas investment. Hmm. You know, today, for example, if you invest in a company in this country, biotechnology, mm. let's take a company like Bugworks, which is one of the leading biotechnology companies. Mm. They're not able to get money in India. So they domicile outside. So we are investors in India. And once you are invested in India, you don't get money, you go outside. We can't follow on with money. You can't mm. put money. Yeah. As individuals, you can't put money. You've got LRS $2,50,000. You yeah. can't put money. But a very big investor, Bangalore, want to put money. The RBI refused permission after eight months. Oh. They don't even reply to you. When you write to RBI, they don't even reply. One of our startups, after one year of running beyond RBI, to get a reply, re-domicile said, I don't want Indian capital, raise capital outside. Mm. They don't care. Mm. They don't even reply to you. Mm. And you know, even in the RBI too, if you look at them, they reply and say, your proposal is rejected. No answer, nothing. Some people get it, some people don't get it. And mm. if you want to get a reply from RBI in Mumbai, you've got to go to a big four and hire them and pay the money to go and lobby for you. That's the kind of perverse thing that happens. Mm. I'm speaking with data. I okay. took it up with Dr. Raghuram Rajan when he came to Bangalore. He mm. promised to do it, but he didn't do it. Mm. I've written to Dr. Shakti Kanta Das also. Mm. And I think it's important. But you know, I'm not going to reply for the last three and a half months. They don't even reply. And then there's something called round tripping. I mm. mean, it's ridiculous. If you're an Indian company, you buy a US company, the Indian subsidiary, you've got to get RBI permission. Mm. Why is that round tripping? You're mm. buying an asset outside and the money may come back to India. Mm. One of our companies, Mm. Headquartered out, headquartered here, bought a US company mm. and they had to wait for a long time because they said you got an Indian subsidiary and it's round tripping, get RBI approval. You go to RBI, they don't approve, take a long time. What do you do? <laughs> and this, you know, India has got nearly $600 billion of reserves. We got mm. the 20 year old loss. Mm. And you write to RBI, they're not responsive at all because it's all customer service. Mm. They're supposed to reply, they don't reply. Okay. And you know, things like this. And we're all scared. And this mm. round tripping, we're all scared. Tomorrow, they all tell you that look, uh, after four years, they'll wake up one day and say, give me this document, give me that document. And mm. then they'll say, send you to ED, et cetera. Mm. So the regulations are extremely perverse. I'm so Siddharth Ket has got yeah. many more horror stories. So okay. I think taxation regulations has to be done away with so that we can have a much better system. And okay. if, uh, if our Indian funds want to invest outside, you know, you can only invest up to 25% of your corpus, yeah. up to maybe 750 million, there's a quota. Okay. And the quota gets exhausted. Then what do you do? Okay. When you build a portfolio, you want companies outside. For example, right. if uh, White Hat is uh, outside India and you want to buy them, you can't invest from India. Any fund yeah. can't invest, only 25%. That's okay. one. And then we don't have enough research in R&D. India produces only 500 computer hmm. science PhDs. Hmm. We need 5,000 computer science, data science PhDs, IoT PhDs, etc. Where is the funding for that? Very hmm. poor. And where are the research done by your universities in artificial intelligence, everything? United States has got a vibrant ecosystem for research. China has got a vibrant ecosystem for research. So we are not getting cutting edge research into our startups to come. The innovation system is just not there. What do you do? 
So there are three things. Capital is a big problem. We're given mm. some solutions. Second is the availability of research and research funding. Mm. And third is very high quality, uh, you know, very high quality, uh, you know, human capital. Mm. You've got to solve this. You see, we are on the cusp of something dramatic. Yeah. And let me tell you one thing, Professor. Prime Minister Modi supports this fully. Mm. He supports this fully. Mm. I'm sure the finance minister supports this fully. I mm. hope so. But when it comes to bureaucracy, when it comes to RBI, it comes to yeah. everybody else, that's not. Okay. SEBI is very good. Mm. SEBI is very good. Because yeah. SEBI is coming out with norms, allowing listing with very relaxed norms, and SEBI is extremely responsive. Mm. So we need a regulator to understand. And you know one more thing, Professor? Yes, LIC sir. has got a balance sheet of 40 lakh crores. Mm. You know, what are the investment in AFs? 1,500 crores. <laughs> because LIC, because of bad regulations, cannot invest in fund of funds. Because mm. they say the cost is too high. And then, then they invest in other startups. They don't even invest. Today, we got, uh, you know, the Canadian Pension Fund, Ontario, yeah. putting in $10 billion into this country. Okay. Okay. Half of it in technology, in startup. They come all the way, take the okay. currency risk and invest here. Yeah. LIC doesn't invest. Oh, right. it's risky. What is it risky? Why okay. are they depriving the policyholders the benefit of the startups, okay. which are creating great value? So all of us work. We create value. Who gets the benefit? Foreign capital. Right. SBI doesn't have any investment, any fintech from his balance sheet. He's got a net worth of 250,000 crores. I've been working with the SBI chairman, and you know, it doesn't happen. They got rules, all kinds of rules. They don't want to change. What do you do with all these institutions which are not supporting innovation? It's very frustrating to be in India. See, I've been in India. We have helped grow the IT service industry. We have struggled. We got policy changes. But we're still working on many issues for the last seven years. And you talk to any young entrepreneur, they say, I don't want to deal with all this. I'll go away. That's why, like uh, Karan said, if your best company is headquartered outside, like Siddha said, they'll do IPOs outside. What yeah. value will you get? We'll all True. become a country where the subsidiaries are there. Sure. Oh, thank you, Mr. I, I know that is a very uh, spirited uh, identification of problems and what could be done. But the, what could be done is still a big question mark. You know, you have seen it all for so many years. Talk to people, given them all the suggestions, but nothing seems to get done. Maybe on that, I'll, I'll come to Siddharth. There are a couple of things, Mr. Mohandas, by which, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, he flagged those points, which I want to bring to you. Uh, staying with the capital flow into the startups, the, the way Mr. Mohandas by talked about is, you know, it's a problem for the huge funds also to come into the uh, invest in startups. And uh, even in the, the small investors like angels, they're also finding it extremely difficult to go near startups and make their investments work. So what is your take on that? What can be done to what is wrong and what can be changed? Okay. I think this, uh, this professor, you, you actually raised a very good question and you also bifurcated it perfectly between institutional capital as well as, as, well as angel investors or, yeah. or what you can actually call retail capital. Uh, I think the overall issue, overall issue is the, somehow the income tax department still has a sort of colonial hangover mm. where they actually want to penalize, penalize Indians who want to participate in, into the, in, in the, in the innovation economy as well as Indian startups. This has actually been exemplified with uh, angel tax, section 26.27b, which I'll just go into briefly, as well as another more pernicious section that people aren't talking about called section 68. Mm -hmm. Both of these are essentially a, a tax on Indian capital actually, actually going into a startup, where this angel tax was basically, it's a tax on the difference between the issue price of a security as well as the quote-unquote fair market value of this particular security. Now, mm -hmm. in spite of the Income Tax Act actually staying that, as long as it's actually been supported by a valuation report by a, either Category 1 Merchant Bank or the Charter Accountant, the income tax department has to accept that. What mm. the income tax department started doing over the past three to four years is that the income tax department started disregarding a perfectly valid valuation report mm. on the basis that the uh, that the uh, progress of the company did not actually match the plans that they created three to four years ago. Mm. Now, all of us being realists understand the fact, understand the plain fact that no plan ever survives a clash with reality. Yeah. You cannot be beholden. You cannot be beholden to a plan you made three to four years ago when the entire construct and the entire all the macro situation actually changed. And they started affecting startups who were affected by demonetization, saying that, look, demonetization, it doesn't matter. You gave us a plan in the year 2015. Mm. In the year 2018, you haven't adhered to your plan. Hence, I'm going to disregard your entire plan. Mm. And they're doing this, Professor, only for Indian capital investing into startups. Mm. It did not in any way affect any amount of foreign capital that actually came in. Mm. The Britishers, India has fought laws against the British during our fight for independence against yeah. these kind of laws. And now Indians have to sit back and just have to accept that, that these kind of pernicious laws actually come in. This is ridiculous. And income tax is a tax on income, not a tax on capital. You tax capital gains when there is an actual gain, not an imputed gain that the tax department actually pick up, uh, 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 imputes in that regard. 
these are the kind of these are the kind of perverse laws that have actually crept into the income tax act and this is the way it's being this is the way it's being militarized mm-hmm. by the tax department even what the government has done to actually uh, address this particular issue they come up with something called form 2 where mm-hmm. a startup has to stipulate that the startup will not buy will not do any loans and advances the startup mm-hmm. will not will not invest in, into any shares and securities for a period of 7 years mm-hmm. after they've after they've last been a startup now a mm-hmm. startup in the country can last anywhere between uh, uh, a startup as per the definition is available for a period of 10 years that means for mm-hmm. a period of 17 years a company cannot cannot uh, cannot deal in shares and securities it can't do any amount of treasury management mm-hmm. in terms of all the capital it raises has either to put the money into fds or its current account mm-hmm. it can't do any mergers and acquisitions to shares it can't invest into another startup for the purpose of an acquisition that by uh, stopping it it can't give any loans and advances to its own uh, employees a salary mm-hmm. advance would actually vitiate this particular angel tax exemption Mm-hmm. if you actually shackle startups and innovation to this extent no startup wants to remain in the country mm-hmm. or the second thing which is a which is an even worse outcome is that a number of startups i firstly know who said no to indian capital they said if i take money from an indian angel investor mm-hmm. no matter how prominent in the name or even an indian company mm-hmm. or a family office i run the risk of actually having the income tax department go after me nobody actually wants to nobody wants to take that particular risk and hence they saying okay. no to indian capital or even worse they decide to actually domicile abroad mm-hmm. along with this we have something called section 68 Mm-hmm. where it just says it's an unexplained cash credit mm-hmm. where the startup is now forced whether the startup if the startup can't address the source of the capital to the mm-hmm. satisfaction of the assessing officer the mm-hmm. entire amount gets taxed at, at a rate of 86% mm-hmm. 86% mind you mm-hmm. and how does income tax department harass startups they make the startup go to the investor and get their tax returns and financial statements for the past 3 years mm-hmm. nobody for a 15 or 20 lakh investment wants to give their entire net worth certificate and income tax returns which yeah. are number one private documents and number right. two the income tax department already has a copy of these yeah. they're forcing the startups and entrepreneurs to actually become middlemen right. this is a kind of harassment on indian capital the third yeah. part which is also a larger a larger issue is this super rich surcharge hmm. indians on long term capital gains basis there's already a huge disparity between listed and unlisted securities where hmm. unlisted securities have a holding period of Two years to qualify as long-term capital gains, as opposed to one year for uh, listed companies. That's number one. They have a higher tax rate of twenty percent mm-hmm. for uh, unlisted securities and startups, as opposed to ten percent for the listed market. Mm-hmm. And number three, they have the super rich surcharge, where in mm-hmm. case your income from your income is above two crore or five crore, you have a surcharge of twenty-five to thirty-seven percent, mm-hmm. thereby driving up the long-term capital gain rate on a fully blended basis to about twenty-eight point five percent, as opposed to eleven percent from the listed market. the professor you know very well that the stock market essentially is all a series of secondary transactions right. from one investor's pocket to another investor's pocket the companies are largely immune to their stock price because except except they can actually raise capital at a yeah. uh, at, at much richer valuations because in case they actually choose to do so right. that being said an investment into a startup is a direct investment into the company that actually goes into new asset creation job creation as well as contributing to economic growth mm-hmm. if you have a if you have a government and a tax department that's trying to incentivize economic growth as well as job creation by taxing the money that actually goes into feeding this at two and a half times the 2.54 times the rate where it's a secondary transaction just between two individual parties mm-hmm. how is it supposed to contribute to innovation mm-hmm. these are the kind of issues that have been raised these are the kind of shackles that have been placed on indian entrepreneurship as well as indian innovation in the country yeah. so yeah. angel investors have been harassed in this particular fashion institutional investors also until the year 2019 if i'm not mistaken actually had the same level of angel tax and all that so when lic invested into a startup lic with its 35 40 lakh crore balance sheet okay. their money could have been said that this money is essentially gotten from round this right. money is essentially gotten from ill gotten gains hence okay. the tax department can actually tax it thankfully they've actually they've actually amended that a few years ago okay. that being said if you look at the institutional capital base in the country Insurance company is the largest. If we, if we study the US, uh, the US startup ecosystem as well. Venture capital in the US started actually ballooning in the in the 80s, in the 80s and 90s because larger institution pools of capital, which are your banks, which are your insurance companies, your pension funds, all of them could actually start investing into startups. So the innovation, the money that went into a Google, the money that went into a Facebook and all, actually owed itself to pension fund money, insurance insurance money, etc. Right. And all this money actually went into it, and this invest. in the us startups and they've grown to a large extent now those same those same institutional international institutions are actually taking a bet on india by taking the currency risk they're taking this entire uh, the the startup risk that actually comes of here the innovation risk mm-hmm. the country and systemic risk that also arise out of investing in india they've taken those risks to invest mm-hmm. whereas you have lic sbi uh, the pfrda nps all of them as mute spectators mm-hmm. the reason why they're all mute spectators the the regulations mm-hmm. alone actually prevent them from actually doing it right. it completely it completely shatters mm-hmm. 
doesn't give them a chance. What the what the entire AF industry through IBCA, I spread others is actually petitioning the government saying, give these give these pension managers a chance in that particular regard. I love them an opportunity to actually choose whether they want to invest into a startup or an or a venture capital fund. Don't restrict them from doing it itself. You have things, and even the pension department, the the PFRD officials have actually stated that the pension they cannot meet the pension obligations of about eight percent. Because yeah. of the fact they can't actually generate those kind of returns right. in this in this era of low growth, in this era of low interest rates, where it's uh, where there's an abundance of capital, everyone's actually chasing growth. That's why the rest of the world is actually investing into the Indian innovation economy because the Indian innovation economy is actually outpacing the rest of yeah. rest of India's growth, Re, rest of India's uh, the, rest of the economic growth of India. That being said, by actually suppressing domestic capital in this regard and forcing them to actually invest only into listed securities, yeah. where they've already burnt their fingers, they burnt mm-hmm. their fingers mm-hmm. since 2018 when a very large mm-hmm. uh, large NBFC went down. All mm-hmm. the so-called AAA AAA rated bonds essentially went to zero in that particular regard. Mm-hmm. They burned their fingers there, but that but those burnt fingers are actually being smeared off on the startup ecosystem, and they're being blamed as a scapegoat and mm-hmm. saying that if the listed guys can't actually uh, can't actually do well, how can we actually support the understood economy? Mm-hmm. That being said, this is why this is why there's been a large flight of intellectual intellectual mm-hmm. property and assets out of the country. Mm-hmm. If, unless the domestic ecosystem can actually support it through local capital itself, mm-hmm. our foreign investors must be comfortable investing into into a US investors comfortable investing into US or Singapore com- uh, uh, company mm-hmm. into Singapore. Mm-hmm. Why? Because you understand the local laws. Nobody wants mm-hmm. to take a cross border risk unless mm-hmm. there's sufficient reason for them to actually do so. Okay. And the government, by the way, the government is actually painfully aware of this. It's not something new. This is something that's been chanted by the entire industry for the past five to six years. Yet mm-hmm. we've actually seen this sort of vehicle-like inertia from the government to actually address this. Sanjeev Bhikchandani went on the record to say that India is going to become a digital colony. Mr. Mohandas Pai has also been speaking about that. Number of people have spoken about it. Yet it's actually falling on deaf ears. And because this is a launch duty problem, yeah. the, the repercussions of this are not going to be felt in the next two to three years. And by the next okay. five to seven years, Okay. The entire innovation contribution of the country is going to be significantly reduced. It'll be reduced okay. to a land of subsidies just because of our policies that were written in the 80s and 90s before okay. a number of the entrepreneurs operating in the system now were even born for that matter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a very powerful way of uh, uh, explaining what at the micro level, what, how things are going wrong for the startups here, particularly with respect to the financing aspect of startups, both the investments as well as the regulations that go around with investments. Uh, we need to take some questions. Before that, I'll have to come back to Karan now. Karan, you, uh, both Mr. Mohandas Pai and Mr. Siddharth Pai have very eloquently explained how the, the investment climate is uh, uh, so uh, so much sort of difficult in the startup world. So that, you know, for both the inflows of investment as well as the management of relationship with investors and the regulation surrounding all of that, it seems to be a very formidable task for the entrepreneurs. Now, uh, you're also now looking at expanding your venture and then doing business in different countries. Uh, let me uh, shift the attention a little bit away from financing right now to the operations part of it. Yes. Uh, are there any advantages, notwithstanding all the limitations we see on the investment side, on the financing side? Are there any things which are going well for the Indian startups? Because Mr. Mohan Daspai also in his remarks said, you know, we have 50,000 startups and the pool is getting added by about five to 6,000 startups coming up every year. So obviously there is some activity going on there. Uh, one way to explain it is that it's by default, these uh, entrepreneurs live here, so they start their venture here. Yeah, that's one way of explaining it. The other way is, is there anything these people are able to do for so many entrepreneurs to still aspire and start businesses here? What in your opinion has works well in the Indian startup ecosystem? Um, Again, I, I have a very practical lens because I haven't thought through it from a like a larger policy perspective and stuff like that. But I, um, as I said, for me, uh, when I uh, I'd spent uh, half of my career in India before I left for the U.S. and I was a U.S. like and I spent the other half of my career in the U.S. I would say the the two or three things that are very distinct and very advantageous in India versus me starting a company in the U.S. was I would I would say the ease of starting a company was very very good in India uh, mm-hmm. as much as it was in the U.S. Okay. I think the the second thing which I felt overall was that um, surprisingly enough, because of the inflow of capital coming in India, I think there is more capital chasing fewer entrepreneurs than people ever realize, mm-hmm. right? I think uh, good entrepreneurs actually, like I think it's almost, I feel that the burden is on the venture capitalist to deploy money more than it's for the entrepreneur, entrepreneur to raise money in some senses, which mm-hmm. I think is a bit unusual uh, because... Uh, like, uh, like I, I think it's the, you know, there's just, there's just a lot of like the the fact is that uh, 
uh, you know, uh, like when I compare it to Silicon Valley, I remember, for example, I mean, to give a very practical example, when I was raising my seed fund, seed stage fund, um, uh, right, right at the time I started the company, in Silicon Valley, when I presented to uh, investors in the US, they couldn't even believe that somebody could present uh, just a PowerPoint presentation and expect to raise funds. Mm -hmm. Right in India, I was, I mean, again, I, I'm not talking about it, it in context of the broader regulation, et cetera, like all, all, all the, the things, you know, that it, but in India on a PowerPoint presentation, I was able to raise capital. And I think that was because uh, I, I still think that in India, there is uh, too much money chasing too few good ideas. And if okay. you are a person who's got a solid idea and a good execution track record, mm -hmm. I actually think India is the most conducive place to start and scale a company. Oh, uh, right, much more to the extent, much more than the uh, than than any other country right now, because mm -hmm. I think the market is thriving with innovation. I think the consumers are adopting innovation. Mm -hmm. Then I think scaling a company in India is always much easier. I would say because uh, typically the phases that you go through in a company when you're scaling is. Uh, you put people against a problem, then you turn it into a process and then you turn it into a product. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US, if I was starting a company and I tried to put people against that problem, uh, obviously, like the human capital of India is such that we are able to kind of uh, scale our operations very fast and then obviously turn that into tech and product solutions, which is obviously the sustainable way to grow globally. Okay. Uh, but we are able to do that. And then I would say, for me, the biggest advantage was the fact that uh, the entire Whitehead Junior model was actually not built on coding, actually, in some ways, although... Vita Junior is associated with coding, but was actually built on women teachers. Really, mm -hmm. the truth was that uh, uh, if I'd done any subject, right, I did coding and we've just launched maths, for example, and we'll do subsequently. Uh, the biggest advantage for us was that there were so many educated, qualified women mm -hmm. who were uh, not a part of, the, who didn't have a voice in the Indian workforce mm -hmm. that uh, became teachers on Vita Junior and became teachers for the world, right? 50% of our, like our uh, students are from outside India now, half of them are from India. And uh, that's because we had the demographic, uh, I mean, I would say uh, like advantage that, and, uh, that, that we had such educated qualified women. So I think if more and more entrepreneurs have the real ability right now, hmm. exactly where I went, right? That there are 50% of women in the college workforce. Hmm. Uh, in, the, in, in college, there are 50% of women. In the workforce, only 23% are women, hmm. right? So there was a, such a huge gap between yeah. okay. every year we were missing so much uh, potential in terms of extremely educated qualified women who didn't have a voice in the workforce and I had this also personal sense because my dad was in the army my mom very qualified lady but she kept following my father around you know from Leh to Assam to Sri Lanka and she couldn't build a career of her own so I had this personal insight I think India again has this very particular advantage where there are very very qualified untapped labor pools that can actually create goods and services for the whole world and I, I feel like if I were to do an entrepreneurship venture again, okay. for the next 10 years, I could come up with ideas like that, where you could uh, tap into this very qualified, educated workforce okay. that's not fully leveraged in the work, uh, workplace that can create goods and services for the world. If any entrepreneur kind of approaches things with that lens, okay. you would uh, see 50, 100 startup ideas in India that could become extremely valuable for the world. Yeah. And if you're able to create a regulatory framework around capturing the value stream of that innovation, Indian workforce, creating goods and services for the world that... Uh, you know, so I, I feel like there's just like incredible amount of potential here overall. Thank you, yeah. Karan. That's, a, that's me, a the nice whole regulation point. thing has been almost like a bit of a, you know, like I, like a, like in a way startups are so binary that you don't think of taxes, right? You're just trying to survive. And yeah. then once you survive, then you start thinking at a very mature stage, you start to think of, okay, like there is some, sure, sure. You're, you're just trying to survive in the early years. So I yeah. think that's why I don't have the views. That's very, why. very nicely put. I think uh, that that sort of helps us to believe that you know there is still a lot of merit in uh, attempting innovative startups here. But as uh, you know, research would say that the real long-term benefits to the economy happens only when the startups grow to be the gasels. You know, they they grow fast and they create a lot of employment. At that stage, the investment floats are extremely important, and how easy yeah. it is for, for startups to you know uh, attract investment and manage those investor relationships. I think that's equally more important. And then, as Siddharth and Mr. Mohandas Pai very eloquently pointed out, in in the long run, even the, the productivity of the economy will also be very much tied to the productivity of the startup ecosystem, unless right. we nurture them the way they are and with all their uh, uh, idiosyncrasies, we may not see much of a benefit in the long run. So on that note, let me go to a few questions that have appeared on the Q&A panel. So let me see a few questions with, uh, uh, which we can try and uh, address. I'm not sure whether we'll be able to address all the questions. I'll, I'll take a few. There is a question from uh, Ranjan Kangar. 
uh, Indian market is big enough to support startups. What does startups involved in defense sector expect from government India? Government of India. Uh, this is very sector specific, Mr. Pai. Would you like to move on this, Pai? Would you like to take that? Or Mr. Siddharth, would you like to take that? So I think the defense, uh, the defense sector has actually actually seen a massive uh, massive push, which is good. Uh, the only thing, the only thing that's going to matter is the amount of capital that's, that's actually required in order in order to create a comprehensive defense uh, defense startup in the country is actually immense. Mm. And that being said, the, the gestation period that also gets attractive with that is also much larger. For example, developing the, developing of uh, the, the guidance system for either for either uh, Michal or someone is far more than mm. actually than actually creating an app. That being said, the patient capital, the patient capital available in the country in order for a startup to actually go through either day technology or defense for that matter, which has a duration of 10 to 15 years, that's actually significantly absent in the country. A large amount of the venture capital that's actually available in the country has a duration of anywhere between eight to 10 years, where mm -hmm. upon, upon investment, they need to actually divest themselves from these particular startups itself. Mm -hmm. That actually becomes one part where the patient capital is actually missing in the country to a very large extent. Mm -hmm. Number two, even the defense procurement rules, although they have actually been simplified, actually have a much more stringent network criteria and an operating track record that most early stage startups actually fail to meet. Mm -hmm. That actually that actually stands to reason because the defense as well, the large amount of vetting actually goes in due to the national security concerns that actually underpin underpin any defense procurement. Okay. This actually this actually results in these startups actually having to partner with anyone from the public sector or the private sector that goes into it. It leads okay. me to point number three. The public sector in the country, despite of despite the Atman Nirbhar announcements of saying up below 250 crores from Indian MSMEs and startups, you know, to go to a tender process, etc., they are yeah. still their procurement rules actually rely on a on a positive net worth, larger operating track record, and it's such a it's an opaque process that these particular companies can't actually partner with that. So the ability mm -hmm. for a standalone company to actually go into defense is actually fairly muted, unless it actually goes with someone from the private sector, or with mm -hmm. a very few number of people. If you mm -hmm. contrast this, professor, with the space sector, where ISO yeah. has actually been extremely receptive. Right. ISO has been exceptionally receptive to actually mm -hmm. meet to actually meet with startup founders, where Dr. Shiva, who's the head of ISO as well, actually personally met with Agni Kul, Bellatrix, a number of these particular founders to understand that, offer the services of ISRO. That's the exact kind of model that all the other Indian enterprises and Indian public sector undertakings need to actually do. So defense is a long defense is going to be huge. The role that Indian startups should play will not exactly be pivotal as of now, unless these con conditions are addressed. But hopefully they start procuring uh, software from startups as well as mm. as well as the adjacent uh, adjacent tools that can actually be weaved together to actually create a truly Atmanir birth uh, defense mm. program in the country. Oh, thanks, Sudat. Uh, Mr. Pai, I, there, there is another interesting question for you uh, where, from Vedant Mimani. He says, while I agree domestic capital is important, but when it comes to IPO, do you think the Indian markets are mature enough and deep enough when individual investors would invest in companies like Bumble at a $2 billion valuation? Okay. I think the question is more about how progressive the Indian investors are, apart from the regular... You know, <laughs> Doc, it is a $2.5 trillion market cap. Okay. And you look at the oversubscription of uh, people like Mrs. Bechter, you yeah. know, and some of this company, enormous amount of over, uh, over, right. over subscription mm. is a myth that uh, there's not enough capital in this country. Mm. It's a very myth. Mm. I think these people should go. You see, raising capital in this country, which many of the startup founders don't understand, mm. is talking to investors and selling your story. You need to have a marketing. Mm. You need to time your market to have buoyant capital. You mm. can't compare India with the United States. Okay. Yeah. But Indian market is large enough. Can somebody raise $5 billion? Yeah. You can raise five billion dollars. Okay. Can somebody raise two billion at twenty-five billion pre? Yeah, you can. You can. Why not? I mean, look at the IPO market today. It's very hot. A lot of people are raising money. Huge amounts of money. The oversubscription is very, very hot, right? Yeah. The key is, are you a growth company in revenues? Most startups don't have profits. That's fine. Yeah. The market doesn't matter. What mm. the market wants? Are you a high growth company? You have to go. Right. You have to market. And let me give you the example of Info Edge. Hmm. Sanjeev Big Channel is company is worth five and a half billion. Yeah. I mean, look at the market value they're getting. Hmm. Do they have great revenues? No. Hmm. Do they have uh, profits? Very less. But they've got it. Look at Hindustan Lever, 50 PE. Hmm. FMCG, 45, 50 PE. I think it's all a myth that you can't raise capital in this country. They should go market. If Flipkart wants to come to India, they can easily raise two or three billion dollars. Okay. It's not too much of money. I'll tell you why. Who are the people investing from the institutional side? Same people invest in New York. The Indian investment, the FPI investment is $600 billion. Hmm. 
24% is FPI, right? $600 billion, correct? Yeah. And the Indian mutual fund industry is large enough. There's enormous amount of money available. So I think, you know, I, do, I don't believe this, uh, that market is, market, market is there. You go try it out. Okay, thanks. That, that's another interesting question. This is, we'll change the topic to the make in India part, which is touted as one of the policies which will help the startup ecosystem because the priority is given for making in India. Uh, one of the questions is that whether this make in India will benefit the Indian companies the way it is touted out to be. This is from Emily Jackson. She's asking whether make in India will really work for the Indian entrepreneurs. Yeah. Or are others who are going to take benefit out of that? What do you think? No, I think it will work for the Indian entrepreneur for a very important reason. See, yeah. earlier when they came with Make in India, it was a statement. There's not, no backing of incentives or nothing like that, right? Mm -hmm. Make in India. Will I make in India? They made a fantastic presentation. Then what happened? Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Now you got the PLI scheme. Mm -hmm. The PLI scheme ties it to extended manufacturing and results. And mm -hmm. you get an incentive for 13 industries. Mm -hmm. The PLI scheme is fantastic. Hmm. The PLS scheme will make it work, hmm. right? And I think it's important. So make it India will take off. For example, in mobile, they're given you a degree of protection. Now people call and say, why can't it be a free market? Why can't you give protection? Let hmm. me give you some data. Our trade deficit in China over the last 10 years is what, $400 billion. Hmm. $400 billion. China will never allow you access to that market. Hmm. They're very nationalist. They will not allow, right? And they come and dump here. You can, you can fight a company. You can't fight a country. Yeah. If you can't fight a $15 trillion coin, we got to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And all these electronics is shifted to China because of huge government subsidies. Now, mm -hmm. they will come here, they will import, they will dump. Mm -hmm. Should we become a dumping ground for China? Mm -hmm. Should we become a dumping ground for Huawei? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just talking to somebody who's telling me that for a very critical uh, critical item in a telecommunication, which is worth at least 40 lakhs, Mm -hmm. Huawei quoted 7 lakhs and got and took it. 7 lakhs was, you know, the value, the junk value of the place mm -hmm. is much more than 7 lakhs. They mm -hmm. subsidize, they corrupt the system. I mean, there's a lot of evidence there. Mm -hmm. I know a telecom company in Bangalore, which is doing high tech, they know they face the Huawei. I mean, Huawei and all these kind of companies, they corrupt the system, they do it. Mm -hmm. And how do you compete, tell me? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, th I think the PLS system is fantastic. Now we actually have a hope. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pai. I think uh, on that positive note, when Mr. Mr. Mohan Pai says yes, there is hope, I would like to sort of you know wind this <laughs> up with a few remarks. I think it has been a fantastic discussion, and as always, Mr. Mohan Pai is known to voice his views without any reservation. I think he has been absolutely upfront and straight in terms of telling the startup uh, what what is in store for them. Uh, I think there are a few things which came out very clearly because we have a lot of work to do when it comes to regulation and helping the capital flow to the startups when they actually need it. And also ensure that the startups do not spend too much of time and effort and a very con confusing trajectory when it comes to dealing with the regulatory framework. That is very well said. Uh, having said that, the positive side is that there is no dearth of opportunities in this country. As uh, Karan talked about, there is there is this uh, human side which feeds into opportunities. As Mr. Mondas Pai said, like you know, there are so many things which we need to do for ourselves, and that poses a lot of opportunities. And of course, if, uh, if uh, from what Siddharth has been saying, that they, we we get to this kind of a, a, a three-cornered kind of a conceptualization of what this is. On the one hand, you have the political leadership. On the other side, you have the bureaucracy. And then the third side is the entrepreneurs. What it increasingly looks like is that the entrepreneurs and the political leadership seem, seem to have come into a kind of a common understanding of how to take this country forward. There is a missing piece somewhere in between. You know, There is a lot of education that needs to be done. There is a lot of change of uh, worldview which has to happen within that particular sector so that the startups are seen for what they are actually in terms of the real wealth creators. You know, the country really wants wealth. Only if you create wealth, you can distribute wealth. That is very obvious to us, right? And the future engines of wealth creation are the innovative startups which are going to sort of turn this country around. And so when you're dealing with them, we have to have a very different kind of a philosophy and a different kind of a worldview to deal with them. And once we adopt that, Hopefully, all these uh, regulatory hurdles will sort of move away, and then they will all be sort of simplified and brought about in such a way that you know it is done with the uh, ultimate objective of making life easier for the startups, so that they can grow to the next stages and do what they are supposed to do in terms of creating wealth, rather than getting stuck even at the stage before creating wealth. I think hopefully we'll. I'm sure uh, very uh, influential spokesperson like Mr. Pai, Mr. Siddharth Pai, they're all working with the policymakers. 
I'm sure today or tomorrow the message will sink into them and hopefully the bureaucracy will change its color and the regulations will become simpler as we go along. But as uh, all of the, all the panels have definitely reaffirmed that this is still a great place to do our entrepreneurial yeah. ventures and this is a great country to work in. And on that particular note, I thank all the three panelists, Mr. Mohandas Pai, Mr. Siddharth Pai, and Karan particularly from a very different time zone, you have joined us now. Thank you all for your time. Thank and you very much. Very valuable insights which you shared with the participants. And I thank all the participants for having been here for, as part of this uh, particular panel discussion. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Doc. Bye. Bye, 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 Sadat. Good, I think uh, we had a good, uh, good thing, good talk. Yeah, and, I think uh, that's good, very good, very good. Okay. No, no, but there are real problems. We have to solve the problem to scale up because, you know, yeah. if you're spending so much of time and energy in fighting all this, what is the point? It's very Absolutely. frustrating. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just imagine with, uh, with more capital, where we'll be. Yeah, yeah. With actually so less of capital, you know, in innovation, considering our need, we have right. done extremely well. It's not that right. we're not done well. India has done very well. India very can do... Five times better. Exactly. And that is the potential. That is what we want. Exactly. And also when people do that, they we want them to feel good about it rather than, you know, carrying it as a kind of a drudgery, right? And that is what makes it very, very... Yeah. I mean, you ask any entrepreneurs who've been in business for three to four years, they'll tell yeah. you horror stories about what happened, Absolutely. this happened, that happened, everybody, you know. If Absolutely. you bought a company sold within two or three years, you make money, wait till you get a notices for income tax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. You know, I've, I've true. been picked up for scrutiny in the last yeah. 10 years, some seven to eight times for no yeah. reason. Why? Because I get a <laughs> refund. I pay That's more tax, true. I get a refund. They yeah. pick you up, they don't give you a refund, they harass you. Yeah. They, you know, ask you some say, five, six, five, six times notices for each year. Yesterday, right. I tweeted mm -hmm. and told the finance minister that, look, you, you've got faceless assessment. Why are you sending these notices? Why are you doing it again? Income yeah. tax wrote back and said, oh, why didn't you file a complaint? Then I wrote back to in Twitter yeah. and said, if I file a complaint, will you protect me against retaliation? <laughs> And if you file a complaint, right. how will you make sure that I get uh, don't get a perverse uh, assessment? Because they right. will get an assessment and uh, sock it to you. Who's True. going to protect you? Right. Then I told them, why didn't you look at a database and check up yeah. and face assessment? How many notices are gone to people? What have yeah. you done? Yeah. Why it is gone? Whether the information you ask is already there and there. Why didn't you make a study? Nobody sees. Right. I met the CBD chairman, some five CBD chairmen in the last 20 years. Yeah. Everybody is a nice person. They right. say yes to you, nothing happens. <laughs> it's only Prime Minister Modi who's able to do something. Okay. I met all the revenue secretaries, they listen, they laugh at you, and they, they go away. Yeah. You know, Nirmala Sitaraman came to Bangalore yeah. last for the budget. Mm -hmm. There were 400 people. We okay. made many suggestions. She yeah. nodded and said yes. The yeah. department, I don't I don't know whether they noted, they didn't have a curtsy to thank you later to say we have seen a suggestion. Yeah. We think it's not workable for this reason, and we look at nothing. Okay. <laughs> they just laugh at you and answer some silly thing and go away. And then they have these budget meetings where, you know, you go for a budget, you prepare and go. They listen to you, nothing happens. They don't even note it down. They don't even reply to you okay. to say, we note a suggestion, thank you, nothing. Right. We're all subjects, like the British Empire, we're all subjects <laughs> of these people. No, Doc, I'm telling you because I worked hmm. here for 35 years. Yeah, I know. Huh? Yeah. I mean, you know, this is the system. We have to break this system. Yeah. That's yeah. why when Prime Minister Modi said in Parliament, wealth yeah. creators should be respected. Sure. These are young people. You must empower them. Public sector is not necessarily the one. They can't yeah. do anything. This country belongs to everybody. Right. That's the point. This country belongs to us. Yeah. We are not subjects. Right. We are citizens. Right. We are not hostages like Manish Sabar Sabarwal says. We are not hostages <laughs> to these people. We yeah. pay the salary. Yeah. And what do we get? Harassment. Yeah. I'll tell you about tax terrorism, but in 19, uh, 2014 and 2019, yeah. when we data is available, mm. tax dispute amount logged up, went up from four and a half lakh crores to nine lakh crores. Okay. And Jaitley before 2014 said tax terrorism has to stop. Mm. He spoke about it in parliament, nothing happened. Mm. He doubled. I met yeah. prime minister and told him, gave him a paper True. on this. Tax, tax demands, tax disputes are double. And they yeah. talk about stopping tax terrorism. They started the Viva scheme. Out of nine and a half lakh crores, I think mm. only one lakh crore is settled by that, yeah. uh, but 25% appeals are gone. Mm. And I asked my friend, who are those people settling? Mm. Because, you know, the settlement is so bad, they say, if mm. you accept our assessment order, yeah. we'll not charge you interest and penalty. First of all, you have socked it to people. Yeah. You're gone in appeal against that. You're not yeah. settling that. We'll yeah. not give you the favor of not charging you penalty. And penalty. Thing. So yeah. who are the people who are done? Yeah. What my friend told me was, who knows all this, said, all the people who are stuck up in these penny stocks, Okay, okay. Uh -huh. Where assessment has been done, when they've been caught. Okay. They're all very happy. 
Yeah. Because they don't have to interest and everything. No right. penalty, no interest. They get away. They pay the tax. They get away. So okay. they're withdrawing their appeals. Okay. They're, so all the crooks are taking advantage of the scheme because they're getting away. Okay. But what about hundreds of people who have got exactly. a bad assessment? Nothing. They have to fight and yeah. fight where? This is the only country in the world because the CFO I have put returns. I have, uh, you know, uh, submitted returns in forty countries. Hmm. Okay. In enforces, we know this very well. Yeah. The only country where the assessment system is broken. Hmm. the appeal system is broken hmm. assessment they can do what they want give you some rubbish hmm. you go to commissioner appeals he will hear it and he will mostly not you know he will pass the same order he will not going to support you hmm. you go to tribunal it take 3 years they may support you hmm. and the tribunal department loses 70% of the cases yes. then they go to high court they lose 75% of the cases high court takes 8 years okay. then they go to supreme court another 5 years it takes 15 20 years yeah and when they go to supreme court they pass an order in the case of infosys hmm. the order was not implemented by the officer we had to go to court to okay. get a contempt petition against them they don't even implement the supreme court order oh. what do you do with them right nobody cares the cbd chairman right. doesn't care the right. revenue secretary doesn't care right. the finance minister doesn't care they don't get into details right they talk you think oh we are doing this we are doing this and they get carried away by their own rhetoric it has no meaning like this right. startups Hmm. You see the finance minister's speech. He said, "Oh, we are doing this. This tax uh, rebate is. We never asked for this tax. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so stupid because in ten years, how many companies startups are going to make profits? Yeah. They have huge carry for losses. See that? Right. How many of yeah. them will make profits in ten years? See that? Yeah. They have carry for losses. What are the users? We never asked. They will. For they will. Huh? But the uh, the surprising thing is, even the carry forward losses, there's a specific rule that applies to startups that in case your shareholding changes more than fifty percent, those carry forward losses are actually excluded, and it applies only to startups. It doesn't apply to listed entities. That actually shows that startups are essentially the short end of the stick, where there's where there's zero, where there's right. even the the dream of parity actually goes away in that regard. Yes. And what do you do? See, the problem is we cannot say goody goody great budget. See, this budget was really good for other reasons, not for startups. This budget is a really good budget yeah. for other reasons, not for a startup. Yeah. But you know, we are getting the short end of the stick. Yeah, short end of the stick. For you know, I spoke to Amitabh Khan. Then he said he will try his best. Nothing happened. <laughs> I mean, you know, everybody, everybody is supporting Taliban. When we succeed, is there Thalia? But yeah. the suffering we undergo. So yeah. I do. That's why I said we should be honest. We should talk about the problems. And I think one day you should invite Nirmala Sitaraman and tell her all these problems. He said, "Look, yeah. you are a finance minister. You are an MP. Please do something." Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, Doc. Good. Thank you. Thank you so Perfect. much, Mr. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Sudat. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you, Nihal and Shloka. Thanks for your effort. Thank you, folks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.